Lord, we dedicate to you this session, this video meeting, this video message, this time of Bible study. We dedicate it to you, Lord, for your glory. We dedicate it to you for the edification of the people who are watching live or those who will see it later. Lord, we pray for your blessing. We pray for your spirit. We pray for the anointing to be in and upon each and every one of us as we consecrate ourselves unto you, as we consecrate our heart, our soul, and our mind to consciously bow down before you and worship you. We bow our thoughts, we bow our emotions, we bow the hidden desires of our heart before your Lordship. And we ask that you purify us, purify us by the fire of your Spirit as we come near, as we draw near the fire. Lord, let your fire burn everything carnal, everything that is of the world, so that nothing will step in between you and us, so that you will manifest your face, your voice, your heart to each and every one of us. Lord, as I am the one speaking, I pray that you would anoint my lips, that the word that comes out is a word according to your heart and mind. Lord, I pray that you would give me the grace to only say the things that you want me to say. And Lord, I pray for the people who listen, that they shall listen, not the person who speaks, but they may listen to your living voice by your spirit. Father, if I make any mistake, I pray that you filter it out by your spirit so that what may remain in every person who listens may be what's coming from you, what is your living word for each person at this time through this which we do in your name, for your sake, for your glory, and to do good to edify the body of Christ. Father, give us the grace to receive even the things that until now we have not had the understanding of. We understand that our mind is limited in capacity. We do not have all the concepts of heaven which you would like to reveal to us. And therefore, Father, I pray, open our intellect that we may grasp what comes from heaven so that we may have an understanding of your language, the heavenly language. And Father, before we proceed with the Bible study, we would like to bring before you the current situation that we are facing as people in the world, as so many people are suffering, as so many people and lives and families are devastated by this pandemic, and how many people are forced into isolation with all the consequences that has in their life, in their finances. Father, we pray in the midst of this darkness, may you show your mercy, may you show your grace. Even though darkness is all around us and apparently spreading faster and faster. Lord, we pray, let your light shine in our hearts let your light, sh light shine in our homes. Let your light shine through us, especially through our prayers, as we give ourselves to prayer. Lord, please turn this around for good for those who love you, but also protect the people who do not know you yet. Lord, we pray one of the blessings that may come out of this devastation, let it be that countless numbers of people may turn to you and may turn away from the current path that they are following which will lead them to eternal peril and eternal torment. May they realize that this is an opportunity that you are giving to humanity to realize which way we are headed if we do not receive the free gift of the atonement that Jesus made for us on the cross by shedding his own blood so that every person who would receive this gift from God 
may not have to go through judgment and end up in the fires of eternal torment, but may be given an opportunity to escape the day of wrath, to escape the damnation by choosing life, by choosing to receive the gift that you give to everyone who comes to you through Jesus, everyone who claims the atonement that Jesus made on the cross through his own body, through the shedding of his own blood. May there be scores and scores of people that may turn to you, even, especially more importantly, people who are now suffering in intensive care units everywhere, or people who have been abandoned in their homes or in the elderly houses because the system cannot do anything about them as is currently happening in Italy. As we hear that so many people die in their homes or in elderly homes because there is no more capacity by the health system to deal with any more patients. And this is so devastating, Lord. But we pray that at least these people may turn to you even the last minute if they have not given their hearts to you, that instead of going to eternal peril, one day they may be in the new Jerusalem that descends from above. They may experience the transition to eternal life, which you give for free to everyone who accepts the message, who accepts the good news, who accepts the gospel of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. Father, we pray, let there be a dramatic turnaround to this galloping situation. Instead of this becoming worse and worse by the day, Lord, let there be a dramatic turnaround. Let there be a stop to this pandemic. Lord, I understand that you are calling us, you are calling the body of Christ everywhere to be in prayer, to be in intercession, to represent you on earth as priests, priests of the Most High God who stand before the Father and cry out on behalf of humanity and cry out to you. We cry out to you, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hallelujah. Good evening. Those of you who are watching live, I pray that as you are watching right now, may the Holy Spirit touch each and every one of you. I pray for the protection of yourselves and your families. The Lord spoke to me this morning and I was so blessed. I was so relieved. I was so... Yeah, I can't explain it. I, I just can't explain it. It's just so awesome when the Lord speaks to you. He spoke to me about the fear of God. He said that those who are covered by my fear, those who fear me, shall fear no evil. No evil shall befall you or your family if you fear me. And for the first time in my life, I perceived the scripture that speaks about us being hidden under the shadow of the wings, under the wings of the Almighty for the first time. I believe it was given to me that that shadow under the Almighty is the fear of God. But I'm not going to say any more right now. Even though the Lord bore additional witness in the process of the day, the heart, the core, the key message that the Lord wants to communicate through my teachings during this week, it is that there is a good kingdom purpose to be accomplished through this period that the congregations have shut down and that the churches cannot continue as normal and we have to reimagine ourselves. We have to reset ourselves. We have to redesign ourselves. And God wants to use this sabbatical, this forced sabbatical, 
to help us redesign ourselves because God has kingdom purposes beyond our simplistic everyday human capacity to grasp. So it does take an absolutely sharp stop and it does take times which are intense when everything forces us to cry out to God and draw near Him so that in that we may actually receive from heaven what the Lord wants us to take hold of it this time and implement it in our lives. So I'm trying to serve that purpose which the Lord has given me as a mandate, as a commission, as best as I can. And so today I believe the way the Holy Spirit wants to help us understand is by means of understanding Matthew chapter 16. Okay, now the teaching, the formal teaching begins. And basically, the Lord wants to redesign the ecclesia, the church, according to the original purpose of God. And the original purpose of God is not easily discerned only by looking at the New Testament scriptures, but we need to go back to the pre-Christ scriptures as Jesus came to fulfill all that was written for him. And therefore, we have to go back to the pre-Christ era, to the dispensation of the Old Testament, to see what does God reveal to us about himself, about his coming kingdom, which we, upon whom the end of the ages has come, and the end of the ages began with the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, so the era of the Ecclesia in the Bible is called the end times, the end of the ages. Now upon us has come the purpose of God to fulfill all that had been written. And so some of the things that we need to take into account as we will be looking at Matthew chapter 16 is that when Jesus was born, the announcement that the angel did to Mary was not that he was going just to give birth to the Savior of the world, but he said, he shall sit on the throne of his father David. And why is that important? Also, if we combine it with what is the most important message that comes out of the Davidic kingdom, what was the heart of the Davidic kingdom? Of course, first we have David himself and his heart, which was after the heart of God. But then his heart, when he was the king of the people of God, then that became the heart of the whole nation and it had a physical manifestation. Now, how did God shape this heart in David before David was allowed to sit as king in the kingdom, in the throne in Jerusalem. David was persecuted by King Saul and he was hiding in the desert and he was hiding in caves. A very careful study of the life of David, especially all the learnings that he acquired in the caves, in the time of living in caves, those learnings are very significant for us to understand what God is doing in our lives now that we are in the kingdom which was in the pre-Christ era, the kingdom of David, but now it is the kingdom of God in Christ Jesus who is the head. In him is the preeminence over all. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords, but he is also the high priest of God. And what was developed in David? Well, two things were developed in David. One, warrior. He was a warrior. The other, he was a priest unto God. The Bible actually does call him a prophet, but we will not go there. What we want to talk about David is that David knew how to pray. He had a heart to pray, to inquire of the Lord about everything. And then when he became the king, what was 
the manifestation, the physical manifestation that revealed both his heart and his learnings in the cave. It was the tent on Mount Zion, the tent of David on Mount Zion. It was a place of worship. It was a place of God with his presence being there and speaking. And David would find in the tent what he had found in the cave. So can it be that God wants to develop that cave training in us as we are isolated in our home? Can it be that God says, I want to teach you what I taught my son David in the days that he was hiding in caves? So we have been forced into isolation. In a way, we have turned our homes into caves. And in these caves, we have been given ample time to spend with God. And you cannot be a mighty warrior for the kingdom of God unless you are first a man of prayer. I'm using the word man in the context of humanity. I'm not referring to gender, to male gender. I'm talking about all people. And so all people in the place of prayer is where we are taught the ways of our king. And our king reveals himself as both a warrior king and a high priest. That's why we also have two manifestations in the pre-Christ era, in the pre-Christ scriptures. We have two manifestations of Yehoshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. Now we call him Joshua in most English translations, but the word Joshua is exactly the same as the name of Jesus. Now for those of you who don't know, the name Jesus, the English name, is from the Greek Isus, so Isus was changed into Jesus, but Isus is the Greek version of the original Hebrew, which you can call Joshua or Yeshua or Yehoshua. And the point is this, we have Joshua the son of Nun, and he was a warrior king, and he was the one who led the people of God to the conquest of the Promised Land. And then we have Joshua in Zechariah chapter 3, the high priest with the filthy garments, and Satan was there to resist him. And that is the court setting in which, before the great judge, Jesus presents himself as the sacrificial lamb who shed his own blood for the atonement of sin on behalf of everyone who believes in him and receives that free gift. So these two aspects of Jesus must be fulfilled in the Ecclesia. So the Ecclesia is primarily called to produce people of God and an army that is made up of both warriors, mighty warriors, and priests who serve in the place of meeting, in the tent of meeting, in the hidden place, in the secret place, in the place of prayer, because that is the manifestation of our head. He is both the warrior king and the high priest. He is both the Lamb of God who died for the sin of the world, but also the Lion of the tribe of Judah who rose from the dead with the keys of authority over heaven and earth. Now, having said that, let me put that in the context of why would God permit the prohibition of church services? How can that be godly? Many people wonder. Many people think that we, the church, should defy the law and continue with our services and they give all kinds of reasons for it. For example, as for me and my house, we shall worship the Lord. And they say all kinds of things which sound very religious, but they're missing a couple of things. That number one, we still live in the flesh and the flesh has its weaknesses. The flesh is in the world and is subject to the laws of the world, but also we are not implying or implementing, applying or implementing our own thought into this situation. Rather, we are called to seek the Lord and say, Lord, what do you say about this? And the Lord would say to us, 
This is for me. Now, this is something that I have said already. I've spoken prophetically into it about the sabbatical rest. I'm not going to speak about it again because I want to speak about what is the Lord, what is the good thing that God is doing through this forced isolation. And I'm telling you, this is from God. I have prophesied it before it happened. And I'm telling you now, God wants us into this forced sabbatical. He wants to train his people in the cave. Gathering as a congregation, worshiping all together is great. We've been doing it for generations. But now is the time to also be trained in a different kind of setting. And it is always God who has his way. And that's what we should be after. What does God want to teach us? Okay. Now, having said that, I would like us to go to Matthew chapter 16 and try to understand in the context of everything that we have been saying, what are the learnings from this, which is one of the foundational scriptures concerning the Ecclesia, concerning the New Testament era. We start from verse 13, which says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now think about it. When you look at the timeline of the life of Jesus, you realize that they walked about 40 to 45 kilometers, if I remember it on the top of my head right, that day, or maybe, I don't know if it took them more than one day, but definitely from the previous place they were, until they reached Caesarea Philippi, we have no historical evidence of what happened. So, they walk for some 40-45 kilometers, they reach a place, and then the scriptures tell us what happens when they have reached that place. Now, remember, they did not have airplanes, helicopters, or cars. So, why would not Jesus ask this question while they were walking. He didn't. Whatever they discussed while they were walking is not given to us. But what is given is when they arrived at Caesarea Philippi, he then asked this question. What do men say that I am the Son of Man? And you think to yourself, why? Why do you have to get to Caesarea Philippi? So let me give you an answer. There may be more answers, but this is my answer. In Caesarea Philippi, there was a place from before Philippus had built the temple in that place in front of a mountain, which, is, was, a, which was a place of worship. And that mountain is called Petra, which means a boulder, a big rock. And at the bottom of that mountain, those of you who have been to Caesarea Philippi, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who have not, uh, when I will turn this video into a YouTube video, I will put in the comments below the link to an article where you will see even pictures of that place. And um, so uh, Caesarea Philippi was the place where there was a cave. This cave was at the foothill at the bottom of the mountain, the Rocky Mountain called Petra. Now, some of you may also know there is another location in the Middle East, and that is in Jordan. There is another location that is also very rocky. It's also called Petra. It's a very touristy place. And uh, so in the bottom of this Petra of uh, Caesarea Philippi was a cave dedicated to the worship of God Pan. Now, you know Pan, whether you know the God or not, you know Pan because he is the source of panic. Because the manifestations of this God in the ancient days was always producing terror upon the people. Therefore, the word Pan, which was a name, is associated with terror, with fear. So even in the English language, it, it is panic, which comes from the original Greek panikos. The point is this God Pan was half goat, half male goat, and half man with a huge male organ. And we're not going to go into the details of what it was but it was, a, it was a big manifestation of Satan, absolutely the manifestation of Satan. And the worship of Pan goes back in history, way back. It precedes even the 12 Olympian gods. 
We don't know how far back it goes, but it was an underworld god who was receiving worship in caves and, of course, deep in the caves. Actually, uh, you may know I, I'm broadcasting this from Athens. We actually have three caves of Pan. One of them is literally sort of across from where I am now. There is a mountain and up there there is a cave where there was worship of Pan. And the village right there is called Peania after his name. Then in the tallest mountain in the west of Athens, Parnitha, there is another uh, cave also where uh, there was worship of Pan. And then in the south of Athens, those of you who know the place near Sunion, there is a mountain called Panion. There was worship of Pan there in a cave as well. So we are talking about a very significant demonic worship that had such power that even the Roman emperor made a temple there and the back of the temple where the sanctuary was, the sanctuary was looking over the cave. So the priests who worshipped there, they would bring the offerings and they would, from the temple, from the edge of the temple, from the sanctuary, they would put it into the cave to God Pan. And th that cave was known as a location, the gates of Hades. So Jesus did not do this conversation in any other place because he wanted to have this conversation right in front of the throne of Satan in that location. I'm using the word throne of Satan because it is mentioned in the scriptures, except it is mentioned for another location. It is mentioned for the place which Jesus said, I know where you live, where it's Satan's throne. And of course, you may know that the altar of Pergamos now is in Berlin. And the altar of Pergamos was to the Greek god Zeus. And so Jesus identifies Zeus as Satan there. And here in Caesarea Philippi, we have Satan in the form of the half male goat. And how do we know that Jesus was addressing Satan? We will see it in a minute or two when he speaks to Peter who manifested the spirit of the location. So there was a very important reason why Jesus made the statements that he did right there at the gates of Hades, right there in front of the rocky mountain called Petra, right there where the Romans were worshipping the uh, Satan, basically, but in the form of Pan. So Jesus asked them, his disciples, who am I according to people? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And now he draws a line and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Simon, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you Simon bar Jonah, meaning the son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my, and he uses the word ecclesia here, not church. Church is a translation, but the uh, uh, original Greek word ecclesia is very important, except I will not tell you that tonight, because I want to keep this teaching short, as short as possible anyway. But uh, before we get there, so we have a line that Jesus draws. On the one side is what people say. On the other side is what revelation people receive from God directly. And so then Jesus addresses Peter. And many people think that because it says, and on this rock, because it is Petra. Now the name in Greek of the man was Petros. So there is a similarity. However, as far as I understand, Petra was the mountain of worship and Peter was the rock, but not that rock. He was the rock that would be a manifestation on the earth of the rock that is Jesus. But the rock that is Jesus manifests in the world through, pe through people, through his ecclesia. So hold on to it, that Jesus by now has become the head, but he has a manifestation in the earth, and that is the people. But which people? All the people who believe in him? Hold on. So there are people who are a manifestation on earth 
of the rock, who is Jesus. And then he speaks to the physical location, which was a location of pagan worship. And he said, I will build my ecclesia. And then he says, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It says here against her is the original. And there is some significance to it, but I'm not going to go into it. And um, the thing is that the gates of Hades was so such an important location that Jesus had to have this conversation and Jesus had to make this constitutional, constitutional announcement of the establishment of his ecclesia right there in front of the gates of Hades. So actually, he went right up to the throne of Satan. He went right up to the place of death, which was symbolic, which was significant of the souls going to Hades, where is the reign of Satan, where the strength of his reign is death, and he goes there and he proclaims, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against my ecclesia. And he says that on the basis of Peter having said the revelation he received from God. He did not say it on the basis of what people say, but on the revelation that Peter received. And automatically we understand here that the purpose of the Ecclesia is not the salvation of people primarily, but the purpose of the Ecclesia is the prevailing over the gates of Hades. Now that leads to salvation too, but leading to salvation is a consequence, is a fruit. But God's purpose is not the, the full, the complete purpose is not limited to the salvation of people. The complete purpose of God goes beyond the salvation of people, but the salvation of people produce on earth the manifestation of the rock who is in heaven. So it's important to understand that the Ecclesia needs to be the body, which means the manifestation of the Christ, the Son of God. So now we need to understand what does it mean? And so Jesus continues to say, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So he makes a declaration of the authority that he, he knew he would have. He did not have it yet because after he rose from the dead, is when he had the keys of death and Hades, and that's when he made the announcement, now all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. But pay attention, please. He did not say to all his disciples, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He said it only to Peter. Why? Because Peter was the only one who had received the revelation from heaven of who Jesus was. Now, why is that important? It's important because there are many Christians who follow the Christ and they follow God, and this is good. The problem is they have not ever received a revelation from him. What they do is they follow what people say of him. And those other people may be great people of God. They may be preachers. They may be teachers. They may be apostles, prophets. So people listen to what other people say, and it is good when we hear the good things about Jesus. Not everybody says everything right. But as long as we depend on what others tell us about Jesus, it is good that we follow him. And I am sure that is good enough to lead to eternal salvation. But for sure, on the basis of what others tell about Jesus, we will not be given the keys of authority. Because the keys of authority have a requirement that the Ecclesia follows carefully the instruction of the Lord. So people must know what the Father says from heaven so that the Ecclesia obeys the will of the Father and does what the Father says. So here Jesus commends Peter because he had this revelation, but he does not commend the person Peter in his totality because a few moments later, we see a major confrontation. So, um, as we move on, and I'm obviously trying to keep it short for the sake of time, 
uh, in verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside, the same Peter who a moment ago spoke out the revelation which he had received from God, to whom Jesus announced, the time will come when I will release all that heavenly authority to you. And he was not speaking to the person of Jesus, he was speaking to the earthly manifestation of Jesus, which is the entire ecclesia, which is the manifestation on earth of the rock who is in heaven. And that, the fact that the person was... A disciple, the fact that the person was an apostle, the fact that the person had been commended by Jesus a moment ago, did not protect this man from a major error which caused Jesus to speak to him the way he deserved at that moment. Listen to it. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Wow. Is this arrogance personified or is this arrogance personified? He calls him Lord and he responds to the words that the Lord spoke and he says, this shall not happen to you. And he rebukes him. And of course, Jesus addresses the spirit that spoke through Peter. He does not address Peter as a human being because Peter as a human being is the chosen disciple, the chosen apostle. In fact, not just one of the twelve, one of the major three, James, John and Peter. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, hold on there. They were in the playground of Pan, in the playground of Satan. They were in the location called the Gates of Hades. It, they were in the location, at the location where the whole Petra mountain, where there were carvings on the uh, slope of the uh, rock, uh, and all these carvings have to do with pagan worship. So the presence of the enemy was there very strong. That's why Jesus went right into the face of the enemy to make his proclamation, to give out his constitutional declaration of what he was going to do. But of course, his disciples had not understood that the fact that they are disciples, the fact that they are chosen, does not make them immune to the manifestation of darkness. And this is something that we need to be very deeply aware of, because the fact that we are the Ecclesia of Jesus Christ, the fact that we may be anointed servants of God, the fact that one minute may, we may be standing behind the pulpit and we may be preaching with the power of God and miracles may be happening, does not exclude us from the possibility that the next moment Jesus would say to us, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. The moment we turn our eyes to the flesh, the moment we allow pride and arrogance to rise up from within us, the moment we think that we can tell God what to do and what not to do, at that moment, Jesus identifies us with the form, with uh, the forces of darkness. And he says, now to me, you are Satan. You may as a human being remain my disciple. You may as a human being in your totality remain my anointed servant. But when it comes to this particular manifestation, you are Satan to me. You are an offense to me because concerning this particular topic, you are mindful of the things of men. Now, I can build on this in many ways and make the bigger picture, but I am trying to come to a close, keeping the core message. And the core message, I want you to understand that God has a good purpose for causing all the churches, all the church congregations to shut down. He wants to force us into a sabbatical. That does not mean that he is the author of death and destruction and devastation. I've said that before. I've explained it. I've got a video on YouTube. You can watch it. God is not Abaddon, the author of destruction. That is Satan. God is the source of life. He is light. He is love. He is good. But when forces of darkness are allowed, are permitted 
for reasons pertaining to the law of sin, the law of righteousness, the law of justice, when the forces of darkness are allowed to sweep the earth with devastation, God still accomplishes his good purpose as he takes that which is evil and turns it around for good for his people, for those who love him. So God had a plan. God was not surprised by this pandemic. Um, several of us have received, I have not received the detail of the pandemic, but I have received the crisis and the flames and Anyway, those of you who have heard me, you know what I'm talking about. The point is, God has spoken to us that this was coming. So through it, God had a strategic plan. And the strategic plan was, number one, to implement a forced sabbatical because we had run out of control, both as a world and as the church. Completely out of control. Why? We have been pursuing tradition and we have been pursuing the things of man. Are we producing the exact image, the copy image of Christ in people? Not really. Now, obviously, I'm overgeneralizing. I'm talking universally. I am not limiting things down to a few congregations, to a few good servants of God, to a few places where things happen in a bit more correct way, so to speak. But when you look at Christianity universally, globally, you see that we may be producing some people who are saved from death. But are we producing copy images of the warrior king and the high priest? Are we producing the royal priesthood on earth? Are we producing people like David who know how to hide in the cave and then come out of the cave and defeat the enemies? No. For the most part, no. And yet, as the Bible shows us, if there is one picture that reveals what the Ecclesia is, I'm telling you that one picture is not a gathering of saved individuals. I will not teach it in greater depth tonight, but the Bible explains that the purpose of the Ecclesia is to be like the tent of David on Mount Zion, and the Ecclesia is a coming together of priests who are warriors, and enforce the kingdom of God, advance the kingdom of God by means of prayer, by means of confrontation with the forces of darkness, by means of advancing the kingdom of God against the gates of Hades. And as the psalmist said, lift up your heads, O your gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, for the king of glory shall come in. Who is summoning the king of glory? We, the body of Christ. But we need to be warriors and we need to be priests so that we can be the royal priesthood that is the complete manifestation of the Ecclesia. And the purpose of the Ecclesia is not a gathering of saved ones. It's a people of authority who have a revelation from God, who hold keys of authority in heaven and on earth, right as Jesus our head has those keys of authority in heaven and on earth, so that we can advance the kingdom against the forces of darkness. That's what God wants to develop out of us in this season. He wants to develop the Davids out of us. And the Davids are not just saved guys and gals. The Davids are warriors and priests who know I live for one purpose alone. And my purpose of life is not to get to heaven. My purpose of life is to bring heaven to earth. Let me say that one more time before I say goodbye. My purpose in life, not me as an individual, because I am only a member of other members that we all together form the body of Christ. I'm only one rock that forms with other rocks the spiritual household of God on earth. And my purpose that Jesus died for is not that I make it to heaven, but my purpose and the purpose of the Ecclesia on earth is to bring heaven to earth. So this is a good moment to say goodbye as I bless you all. And I pray that this season of the cave, this season of the fires and the flames of purification, this season of drawing near God in this fourth sabbatical shall be the best, the most beautiful and the most fruitful era of our lifetime. It is already becoming one for me. I love it. I love to spend hours and hours in the presence of God and all to expect to do for days and days and weeks ahead is just that, nothing else. How beautiful is that.